Good morning. Wow. You know, everybody's wearing masks, so we really can't tell. We won't be able to tell whether you're appreciating what we're saying or not. So <laughs> if your eyes close and you go like this, we'll know. So, um, so who's happy that we've had a change in the season finally? Oh, my gosh. I thought I was going to die of heat a month ago. So this morning we're going to be talking about the seasons of the Lord that he's put out. So as, as Brian uh, mentioned, he's asked us to speak about the feast, uh, particularly what's commonly known as Rosh Hashanah, but in the scripture it's called the Feast of Trumpets. Um, as he said, we, we lived in Israel for 15 years, and when we were there, uh, we were able to celebrate the feast with the whole nation because they are national holidays on these these times. Uh, but actually, before we ever went to Israel, we began to learn about these things <clears throat> some close to 30 years ago now. Um, and we wanted to celebrate these. We we're living here in Jacksonville. Marion and I are both from Jacksonville, by the way. Natives, any other natives here? Two, three, that's it, yeah. <laughs> Not many of us, but we grew up here. Um, so we wanted to celebrate the feast, but how did we do that? And trying to figure out how to do that was a challenge. Uh, we could read what the Bible says, but we don't have a temple and the sacrifices aren't happening, so we, much of that didn't apply to us. Um, we read some of the uh, history and the things that Jewish people do today, and, um, and then we just prayed a lot and asked the Lord, how do we do it? And little by little, we were able to... Uh, just establish our own our own way of keeping these things in a way that was a blessing to us. So, uh, before I say anything else, I want to make one thing very clear. Um, we're not trying to tell any of you that you have to celebrate the Feast of the Lord, that it's because we're not under the law. We're going to say that more than once. We aren't under the law. Everybody got understand that? We're not, we're not trying to put anybody under the law. It's not what we're doing. What we found is that celebrating these things has been a tremendous blessing in our life. So what we're trying to do is invite you into experiencing the blessing that the Lord is offering for you. So, um, do you know that God has a calendar? That in the scripture, there actually is a calendar. And that's where we're going to head. So God's calendar revolves around the agricultural seasons, the harvest times, spring, summer, and fall. And during each major harvest, he called the people to come to Jerusalem to worship him. He called these times of worship his appointed feasts. Now, Pastor Brian did ask us to speak about Feast of Trumpets, and he did ask us to speak about specifically this time. But we need to give you some background so that you know how all this fits into the whole calendar. Leviticus 23, 1 through 2. We can't see it on this screen. Okay. Well, I can't really see it from here. But <laughs> the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. He doesn't say these are the Jewish feasts. He says, these are my feasts, the feasts of the Lord. And there are two specific phrases there, the feasts of the Lord and holy convocation that are used. I want to explain these words to you in Hebrew, not that you need to learn Hebrew, but I want you to understand a little bit deeper meaning of, of uh, holy convocation and feast of the Lord. The word feast is the Hebrew word moed, or we, to make it plural, moedim, more than one. And that word moed means an appointment, a fixed time, an appointed time, or even like a date with God. Some of you young folks are dating now, and some of you older folks are maybe still dating and have dated in the past, but a date is a really special thing when you get yourself ready and you prepare, and you have something in mind that you're going to do. So think about this word moed as a date, a date with God. And the other word, which says um, they're a holy convocation, 
is mikra, mikra, a holy convocation or a solemn assembly, or we'll talk about in a few minutes, a rehearsal. So how did they know when God wanted them to come to his appointed times? So I want you to look at another slide, which I should have put in my notes, Genesis 1, 14 to 16. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. So on that day, when God created the sun and the moon and the stars, he did it for signs and for seasons. And that word there that we translate in English, seasons, is the same word for feasts. It's moed. So God is saying right there in Genesis, in the very beginning at creation, I'm going to give the sun and the moon and the stars because I want you to know when I want you to come and meet with me. So God had the feasts in his heart from the very beginning. Um, I want to let you know this, and we're not really going to talk about this today, but in, in Leviticus 23, God lists the feast, and the first feast that he lists, that's the first feast that he lists, <laughs> is the Sabbath, Shabbat. And he explains to us when is the Sabbath. The Sabbath is on the seventh day of the week. The Sabbath is a weekly time set apart to meet with God. So I want to explain one other thing to you about the way God considers time. Because in our thinking, time begins, the day begins at sunrise. Sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, right? Wrong. Because in Genesis 1, when we go through the creation story, remember it says, and evening and morning was the first day. And evening and morning was the second day. And evening and morning was the third day. You getting it? And evening and morning was the fourth day. So when does the day start? In the evening. In God's way of thinking, the day starts in the evening. So today actually started last night when the sun went down. Okay. So in, if you want to look at all the feasts and you want to see what the Bible says about all of them, go to Leviticus 23. And Leviticus 23, verses 4 through 44, will explain to you all the details of the feasts of the Lord. I just want to say one other thing to you about the feasts as we're talking about them, because we're sort of applying them to ourselves today. But when God gave the feasts, he gave them to Israel. And Israel has kept the feasts and stewarded the feasts for thousands of years. And for the most part, the Christian church ignores the feasts. So we just want to, I want to honor Israel always for that gift. They've hung on to something very precious and very valuable and very significant for us. And I just want to make sure we know that God gave it to them first and they've kept it. And because they've kept it, we get to know about it and participate in it. So we want to honor them and bless them for that. I said to you that the, um, the feasts of the Lord revolve around the uh, agricultural season of the, of the year. And so we have three times of feasts in Scripture, in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall. In the spring feasts, we have Passover. And God calls that the 14th day of the first month. Then we have unleavened bread, the 15th to the 21st day of the first month. And then we have the, the Feast of First Fruits. And that's a little tricky because you start counting that on the first day after the Sabbath that falls during the week of unleavened bread. Are you guys confused yet? <laughs> Every year we have to think about this again. Now, how exactly does this work? The second time, it, we're not doing the spring feast, so you don't even have to know that now. Uh, in the summer, the second time of, of harvest, and that's the Feast of Weeks. And we in the church know that feast, and we call it Pentecost. But it's called Pentecost because you count seven weeks plus a day. So seven times seven is 49 plus one is 50. And then in the fall, and this is where we're really going to focus most of our attention today because we are in the fall, the Feast of Trumpets falls 
on the first day of the seventh month. We happen to be right now on the biblical calendar. Remember, we showed you the calendar at the beginning. In the biblical calendar, we are, we are on the seventh month, which is the month of Tishrei. And the first day of the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets. The tenth day of the seventh month, and we're, we're, gonna, we're going to observe that next week, is the Day of Atonement. And the 15th to the 21st day of the seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, for reasons having to do with how they calculate the rising of the moon, the Feast of Trumpets is actually celebrated on two days because we want to make absolutely sure that we don't miss it and we get it right. And so the Feast of Trumpets began at sundown Friday night till sundown Saturday night was the first day. And then sundown last night till sundown tonight will be the second day. So today we are celebrating the second day of the Feast of Trumpets. On our calendar, the Gregorian calendar that we use, today's date is September 20th. But on God's calendar, today is the second day of the month of Tishrei. It's the Feast of Trumpets. Now we already explained that the word used for feasts and for seasons is moed, or appointment, or date. And the word used for convocation can be translated solemn assembly, or rehearsal. So when we look at the feasts, I want you to think about the idea of rehearsing. And rehearsing can be rehearsing something that has already happened in the past, like we're reviewing it over and over and over again, or it can be rehearsing for something that's going to happen in the future. We're practicing like we do for a play. That's exactly right. So now we're going to go to our visual aid, this uh, menorah, which is covered in solid gold paint. <laughs> Some of the people in this room helped us paint this. Um, but it has seven branches. If you don't know, there was a menorah in the temple, which was lit all the time. And it was made of pure gold, the one that was in the temple. Wish we had that one. They say it would be worth about $7 million today, the amount of gold that was in it. So, uh, so what we're going to do is re use each branch to represent one of the feasts. Now, here's what I want to say uh, about what we just said. God said he, he made appointed times and he told the Israelites to do this stuff and they did it. And most of it was remembering things from the past. But this God that we serve is so amazing, isn't he? Isn't he an amazing, unbelievable, unfathomable, all-powerful God and the things that are in his mind and heart are so far beyond what we can comprehend. And I believe the feast are... He incorporates that in them because not only did he give Israel this stuff to do to remember, but he had it in his heart that in the future that was going to mean something that was even going to be better than what they were remembering. So we're going to start off with the first branch being Passover. Now, most of you know what Passover is, that uh, this is when, if you don't know what Passover is, you can read your Bible or you can watch The Prince of Egypt, which will basically give you the story. Uh, and it's a great story of deliverance that God went to Egypt and by signs and wonders, and he says with his mighty right hand, he delivered the Israelites from the bondage of slavery, didn't he? Took them out with all those miracles, um, took them out supernaturally, took care of them. But what happened? So he told the Israelites, remember this, celebrate this Passover forever. He told them to do it forever. That was the commandment. Some hundreds of years later, something like 1,200, approximately 1,250 years later, what happened on Passover? This guy we know named Jesus was on the scene, the son of the Most High God. And what happens? He is sacrificed on the day of Passover. He is crucified, and he becomes the lamb that was slain. So we're not any longer remembering that painting of door painting of blood on a doorpost. We're now, we're now experiencing the painting of blood on our hearts, which brought forgiveness of sins for Israel and for the nations, for all of us. 
How much better is that deliverance? We've been delivered from the bondage of sin and death, not just from slavery. So God has something much more important in mind for Passover. Now the next feast, which was unleavened bread, God said, told Israel to do this, celebrate this uh, forever. He said, this is a, I want you to keep doing this until forever, which is a long time. So what did unleavened bread represent? It represented when they left Egypt, the day after the Passover, when they left Egypt, the women were, they took their bread dough. They didn't have time to put leaven in it or yeast because they were in a hurry. So what did they do with it? They, it says in the Bible, they wrapped it up in a cloth and carried it in their arms as they left Egypt. And they were supposed to have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. As, as some of you might know that during Passover you eat just matzah. You don't eat bread with leaven in it. I hate matzah, but I eat it every year. And remember the suffering, uh, you know, suffering of the Israelites. But, and I remember this. This is what they were supposed to do. Thousands of years, I say thousands, hundreds of years later, 1,200 years later, what happened? Jesus, who was crucified the day before, he gets wrapped in a cloth and put in the grave. He's now the unleavened bread. Because in the Bible, leaven often represents sin. But Jesus had no sin. He was without sin. And he was wrapped up and put in the grave. God had something much greater in mind for the Feast of Unleavened Bread when he gave this to the Israelites. And today, if you participate in a Passover Seder, even non-believing Jewish people who have a Seder meal at Passover, this is part of what they do. They take a piece of matzah and they wrap it up. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know that today it represents... uh, Jesus, Yeshua, being put into the grave, wrapped and put into the grave. But it does. So that's the second branch. Now the third branch is the Feast of First Fruits. Now, the Feast of First Fruits was to fall on the Sunday after Passover. Okay? Now, what happened on the Sunday, 1,200 years later, after Jesus was crucified and he was buried? What happened on that Sunday? He was resurrected. Hallelujah. We celebrate it today as Easter. In the Bible, it was the Feast of First Fruits. And it was all of these things were probably accidental. That it was just probably just coincidental that they happened, weren't they? Not for a second. The mighty God we serve had this all planned out. So the next branch, which is called the Feast of Weeks or as we know it as Pentecost, we all know what happened then. Now, if the, in, in history, it's believed by not just Jewish scholars, but many Christian scholars, that Moses came down from the mountain and gave the Torah, or the law, on the day of Pentecost, on the Feast of Weeks, that it happened then. And that's what Jewish people today celebrate. Uh, and as we know, hundreds of years later, Jesus had, he was crucified, buried, resurrected. He ascended into heaven. He told his disciples to go into Jerusalem and wait for 100. And they waited, the 120. And what happened? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of a feast, an appointed time that God had set apart these appointed times, not just for a uh, religious ceremony for Israel to do, but he had intentions for the rest of it. So um, these feasts, the first four feasts that we've talked about, they have all been fulfilled by Jesus, haven't they? But the fall feast, which are remaining, they have not yet been fulfilled. So Marianne told you that the fall feasts are today. We're celebrating the Feast of Trumpets. Um, next week, the Day of Atonement. Uh, and the following, the last one, just looking at my notes here so I don't say things I'm not supposed to say that she's going to say. So, um, the last one is the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, it hit Marianne and I as we were preparing this message and thinking about it that 
the name of our church is very appropriate as we're thinking about these things because up until here, it's Maranatha, the Lord has come. But from here over, it's Maranatha, the Lord is coming because he's going to come back and he's going to fulfill these three feasts. So this is the season. We talked, so we're going to talk about the Lord's seasons. Right now, we're in the season between these fulfilled feasts and the unfulfilled ones. How's that so far? Are you guys getting this? It's a lot of detail, I know. I have to find my page here. <laughs> so Leviticus 23, 23 to 25. This one's in my notes. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. That's what we're celebrating today. This is the day. This is the Feast of Trumpets. It is a holy convocation. It is a solemn assembly. Well, we we already are that because when we come together every Sunday morning, we're a holy convocation. We're a solemn assembly. We're coming together to worship the Lord, to offer up sacrifices of praise, to offer to him gifts and and, um, offerings of whatever we have. In the temple, it was sheep and bulls and all sorts of things like that. We don't have a temple anymore, and we don't have an altar to burn sacrifices on, but we have other ways of giving gifts to the Lord. So today is a day of trumpet blasts, a holy convocation, no customary work. That means it's a Sabbath. It's a day of rest. Today, according to the biblical calendar, this is what we're celebrating, the Feast of Trumpets. As Stephen said, it's commonly known as Rosh Hashanah. But Rosh Hashanah means, literally, the head of the year. So if you remember when we went through the months and we talked about the fact that Feast of Trumpets falls on the first day of the seventh month. So what month are we in on the biblical calendar? Seven. Does the new year start on seven? No, the new year starts on one. Does anybody know, according to the biblical calendar, what is the first month of the year and what is the feast that's celebrated then? Passover. That's right. The month of Nisan is the first month of the year, and Passover is actually the new year. I don't know why it's not celebrated that way in tradition, but that is what it says in the Bible. And, um, you know, we celebrate the new year traditionally when? January 1st. But the new year in God's, according to God's word and according to the biblical calendar, is at Passover. This day today is called Yom Teruah. Yom Teruah doesn't exactly mean, it doesn't exactly translate Feast of Trumpets. What it actually translates as is the Day of the Blast, the Day of the Trumpet Blast, the Day of Clamor, the Day of an Ear-Splitting Noise, (laughs) the Day of Joy, of Shouting, of Rejoicing, a day of battle cries, a day of crying out, Maranatha. That's a Feast of Trumpets. So now what we want is everyone who's brought a trumpet with you today, everybody who's got a shofar or a trumpet or some kind of noisemaker, we're going to say one, two, three, and we're all going to practice. And if you don't have a noisemaker, I've actually heard people make the most amazing shofar sounds with their mouth. Or you can just scream Maranatha. Okay, so get, everybody get ready. Where's Rob? Yeah, there he is. Okay. So when I count to three, we're going to make our clamor because today is the day of clamor. One, two, three. <laughs> Okay, so in 
the simplest form, we have just celebrated the Feast of Trumpets. We've come together as a holy convocation. We're resting. We're not doing any work. And we just made a great sound to the Lord. That is the Feast of Trumpets. Good. That's good because we're going to get even noisier than this. So when we first went to Israel in 1998, we were really excited because we thought we get to celebrate the feasts, the Moedim, in Israel. But it didn't take us long to figure out that if we celebrated the feasts according to Jewish tradition, then we would not be celebrating the feast with the revelation of Jesus. And if we didn't celebrate, as believers in Jesus, if we didn't celebrate the feast with the revelation of Jesus, there wouldn't be any life in it for us. So as Stephen said, we began to ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want us to do? How do we do this? We, we want to do this, but we don't know how to do it. And so one of the first things the Lord taught us was the first thing we taught you. These are my appointed times. I want to meet with you at this time. You come. You get yourself ready, and you come to me, and you come expecting something because I will be there. And if you come expecting and I come, we will have a good meeting. So I just want to encourage you all right now as you're thinking about the reality that you're here. You're here at a holy convocation on the Feast of Trumpets, worshiping the Lord and blowing trumpets. And prepare your hearts because he's here too. Not that he isn't always here, he's always here. But he especially wants to meet with you today. So Lord, we just ask you to speak to us. We want to know what you have to say to us individually and what you have to say to us corporately about the Feast of Trumpets and how you want us to celebrate this feast in you. So one year when we were celebrating the Feast of Trumpets, it occurred to us that it's a day of clamor. It's a day of proclamation and acclamation. So that year we went back in our journals and we looked for prophetic words that the, word ha- that the Lord has given us and scriptures that the Lord has given us and things that have been spoken over our lives. And so on the Feast of Trumpets, we took those to the Lord with shouts of acclamation and said, Lord, you said this about us and you said this about us and you said this about us and we trust you and we believe that you're going to bring all of this to pass because you're a good God and you're a great God. We also did the same thing for Israel and that's really easy because you just open your Bible and almost every page you turn to, you're going to see something that God said about Israel, something that you can speak back to him and pray back to him and speak over Israel prophetically. So that became part of how we celebrate the Feast of um, Trumpets. And so I've got some pictures here. The last nine years that we were in Israel, we lived in a little town called Omer, which is the closest town to the historical site of the Well of Abraham. So we started going every, um, every Feast of Trumpets with our friends. And some of you re- may recognize Mariana there in one of those pictures. She's been here at Maranatha Church to speak before, but we would go out there on the Feast of Trumpets with our friends, with our shofars, with our trumpets, with our declarations and our proclamations and our Bibles, and we'd worship out there and sing to the Lord and make lots of noise and pray over each other, and it was a wonderful way to celebrate the feast. We really enjoyed it. Something the Lord spoke to us this year as we were preparing to speak to you and Stephen alluded to it, and we'll probably repeat it again, is that the feasts were in the heart of God from creation. It's not something he thought about after he brought the Israelites out of Egypt, like he said, okay, well, i got to do something with these people, give them something to do, keep them busy. No, he was already thinking about the feasts in creation, and he gave them to the Jewish people to rehearse, as Stephen said, for about 1,200 years, and, and, and the whole time they're, they're rehearsing, they think they're looking back. They, they're just remembering, and they are, and it's, that's legitimate. If, if it were only that, it would be enough. They're looking back to something God did for them, but they didn't know that they were rehearsing something else that God is going to do for them and for the whole world. And they carried that for us, like an intercession for hundreds of years, and they didn't even know that they were doing it. 
And so we have so many reasons to thank God for Israel, to bless Israel, to pray for Israel, and pray for their salvation, because their Messiah is our Messiah. Another thing I want to tell you about looking into the feasts in Scripture is um, if you saw those calendars that we put up, and it has names like Nisan and Elul and Av, and those are the Hebraic names of the months. If you go looking for them in a Bible concordance, you may not find very much because God also calls the, the months just according to the number the first month, the second month, the third month, the fourth month. So if you want to see what happened in Scripture during the Feast of Trumpets, you're most likely going to have to look for the phrase the seventh month. And if you look for the seventh month, you will find more about what happened in Scripture. And once you know that and you start paying attention to when things happened in Scripture and what month they happened and what is happening on God's biblical calendar, you begin to see that his... Creation is so incredibly orderly and so detailed and probably so much more than we could ever think or imagine that he's doing day by day, month by month, season by season. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Brian mentioned um, this king in the history of Israel named Josiah. Josiah was just a boy when he became king, only eight years old. And there had been some bad kings before Josiah, and they had stopped worshiping God in the way that he wanted to be worshipped. And they had actually allowed other gods to be worshipped in the temple, and they had lost the Torah, their Bible. They didn't even have it anymore. Pastor Brian mentioned that a couple weeks ago. So Josiah, when he became king, he sent some people to clean up the temple. And in the process of cleaning up the temple... They found the book. They call it the book of the law. They found their Bible. And the high priest gave it to a scribe who took it to the king who read it to King Josiah. Now, by this time, Josiah is about 24 years old. Anybody in here 24 years old? Wow, we need some 24-year-olds in here. <laughs> but he's pretty young, like college age. Now, when it happened that the king heard the book of the law, their Bible, he tore his clothes. That's a sign of grief and mourning, and Jewish people do it until today when someone dies. They tear their clothes. And the king called all his elders together and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both great and small, and he read the book to them. Right there in front of the people, he made a covenant with God to keep God's commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul and all his might and to do everything that was written in the book. And then the very first thing Josiah did in obedience to that book was to keep the feast of Passover. And often we see in scripture when the, when the Jewish people, when God's people have turned away from him and have not walked with him, and they suddenly realize, wow, look how far we've come. They get themselves back on his calendar. They get themselves back on his days and his seasons and his times because he reveals himself to us in those times. Josiah had never heard the word of God. And when he heard it and he learned that they had not been doing the things that God wanted them to do, he was grieved to the core. And that's exactly how Stephen and I felt when we first learned about the Hebraic roots of our faith. We felt like, why did nobody ever tell us this? How is it that I've been reading my Bible my whole life and I didn't know about these things? I didn't know that Jesus was crucified in the context of the biblical feast called Passover. I didn't know that the Holy Spirit came in the biblical context of a feast called weeks. I thought Passover, I mean, I thought Pentecost happened the first time when the Holy Spirit was poured out. I never knew that the Jewish people had been celebrating that feast for hundreds of years. And it grieved me to know that. No one had ever told me that the biblical feast pointed to the first coming of Messiah and the second coming of Messiah. <laughs> 
And you know, when we knew we were angry, <laughs> kind of mad at the church, but I guess really it's not the church's fault because it's my responsibility to know what's written in the book. But the Lord has been gracious to us and, and helped us to see that, that we're, all in a, we're all in a process of time with him. And he, he's doing things in his calendar and in his time clock that I don't really know about. And I think one of the things he's doing now, even in this generation, in the last couple of decades, is revealing his feasts to all of his people. Because he has something that he wants us to know about him that we know when we understand the feasts. Again, I want to be clear, as Stephen was before, we are not under the law. We're not under the law. You're not under the law. Nobody here is under the law. If we, if we don't keep the feasts, we're still walking with the Lord just like we were yesterday. It, it's a blessing. It's meant to be a blessing. It's meant to um, help us see and know and understand more of the Lord. But it's not in any way um, a burden. So one more past portion of scripture I want to give you. Fast forward after Josiah to Nehemiah. And God's bringing the Jewish people back to their land. And they've struggled to rebuild the temple. And there's been lots of opposition. And it's taken decades. And then, catch this little phrase, because I promise you I've probably read it 20 times and never saw it before. On the first day of the seventh month. What feast happens on the first day of the seventh month? Trumpets. Here we are today. On the first day of the seventh month, Ezra and Nehemiah gather all the people together in Jerusalem, and Ezra the scribe stands up on a wooden stage like this, and he starts reading the word of God to all the people. And scripture said, it's everybody, young and old, small and big, everyone who could understand comes and stands in front of Ezra, and Ezra reads the whole Bible to them the whole Bible that they had at that time, from early morning till the middle of the day. He stands there reading, and they stand there listening. And when they get to the part about the Feast of Trumpets, and they realize, today that's now. Right now, today. Today is the first day of the seventh month. Here we are, and we haven't been prepared. We aren't ready to celebrate And God wants us to celebrate today. And they begin to weep and to grieve. And Nehemiah says to them, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. And then he says to them, Go your way. Eat the fat. Drink the sweet. Send the portions for those who have nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. I didn't realize until we were preparing for, to talk to you today, that scripture, the joy of the Lord is your strength, is in the context of the Jewish people finding their word again, listening to it again, entering into God's calendar again, and celebrating the Feast of Trumpets. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Interesting, that verse that says, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. It's tradition in Israel, if you were there during this season leading up to today, people send gift baskets to friends and and relatives, and it's it's a time of giving gifts to one another. So, um, we only have 26 more pages of notes. I'm just kidding. Only kidding. What time is it? Okay, we're doing fine on time. Are we doing fine on time? Okay. I'm, a, I'm asking those people sitting in their easy chairs in their living room watching us. They don't have masks on and they have a cup of hot coffee. And Did you hear what she just said? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's a little easier, or it's much easier to look back at the feast that have already been fulfilled and see the fulfillment that's happened. It's a little more challenging to look forward to the unfulfilled feast and see what do they represent. But we're going to do it anyway. So this feast today, the Feast of Trumpets, the shout, the blast, it's, it's saying uh, get ready for the Day of Atonement. And what is the Day of Atonement? 
the most holy day on God's calendar. And the Feast of Trumpets, I mean, a trumpet blast represents lots of things, but one of the things it represents is come to attention. It might represent that the enemy's coming. We need to get the, we need to get the soldiers out. We're fixing to get attacked. Uh, so um, in terms of the fall feast, it's, it's a call to attention, saying, here come the fall feast. And these days leading up to it are called the days of awe. The days leading up, sorry, I didn't say that clearly. The days between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement are oftentimes called the, the days of awe. So this feast, the Feast of Trumpets, is a trumpet blast. What do we know is going to happen when there's this enormous great trumpet blast? Hallelujah! It didn't happen today yet, but it's still good. But I believe it's going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. That makes sense. Why would God, I mean, maybe it'll happen on another day. He told us we won't know the day, but um, we don't know the year. But that could be. Wouldn't that be awesome if this is that day? It makes sense to me. So the Day of Atonement, which happens 10 days later, uh, if we were counting from Friday night, which is the first, first, time, first night of uh, the Feast of Trumpets, and the Day of Atonement is the most holy day, and it's the day when the priest made sacrifices and they went into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled blood, and they, they sanctified the whole temple. They purified it by blood. And then what did they do? It's this whole thing, I'm not going to go into all the details, but you know the story. There are the two goats, they, they sacrificed one goat, the other ones, they confessed the sins of the nation. It's a, it's a time of confessing the sins of the nation of Israel as a whole. And I'll just stop to stay here. Don't we need to confess the sins of our nation right now? Isn't this a time for that? I, I believe it is. As Brian said, things are pretty weird and getting weirder. We need to confess our sins. We're, we're a sinful nation. And um, this is a great time for that. Yom Kippur. So the... Prophetic fulfillment of that is, of this, of Yom Kippur, is, I don't think it's clear, but many people believe that it's going to be a time after Jesus returns when the Jewish people turn and they see the Messiah and they recognize who he is, that he is the Son of God, that he is their Messiah, and that they look upon him who they pierced and they weep as the prophet Zechariah foretold. Makes sense. Last week, Pastor Gary said he believes that Maranatha Church is in a season of reflection. He spoke about how the Lord is inviting us as a congregation into a new place. He talked about how God wants us to take inventory to see what doesn't belong to us in this new season, what needs to be left behind, and what things need to be brought in to this new season. He, went, he talked about us looking to see what we might have lost along the way that needs to be restored to us. So much like the Israelites in the days of Josiah and Nehemiah, Pastor Gary said he feels like God wants to remind us of promises from the past and give us new promises for the future. So I think that this season, these days of awe from, from Feast of Trumpets, to atonement. It's like today's a wild celebration and a trumpet call, and then we go into this very somber place with the Lord for 10 days where we're examining our own hearts. We're allowing him to examine our hearts, and that can be a very personal thing, but it can be a corporate thing too, and it certainly was a corporate thing for the people of Israel to just see, what are you saying to us, Lord? What What is it you want us to know and understand, and how do you want us to go forward. And so as Pastor Brian already said in the announcements, this week the everyday devotions will focus on that. It will f focus on prayers of repentance and preparation for a prayer gathering next Sunday night for Yom Kippur. Okay, so we're, we're down to the last two pages, almost page and a half. 
So the last feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And we have some slides from when we celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles last year. You know, the Israelites were commanded to build a booth or a tabernacle and dwell in it for seven days. This is the booth I built last year uh, in our backyard. I'm going to build one this year, weather permitting. So um, you can go to a few of those slides. There's some people you might recognize in there that came to. We like to celebrate and have people over and enjoy the time and swap mosquitoes because we have them in our yard. But uh, it's the Israelites were commanded to, to rejoice before the Lord during the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so the last one in the unfulfilled section of our menorah is the Feast of Tabernacles. And what can that represent? It's probably going to represent when Jesus returns and we eat tabernacles with us and we live with him forever. And if you don't know, some of you might know, but because there are people who say, we don't need to do any of this. This is all done with. It's in the Old Testament and it's never happening again. But if you look in the book of Zechariah, it talks about the Feast of Tabernacles in the end times when Jesus is here and it says nations who don't send people to uh, worship at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, they will not get rain in their nations. So it is, it is going to be celebrated again uh, when the Lord's here, when, when Yeshua's here. So uh, for us, it's like, wouldn't it be an awesome thing to be celebrating these feasts when, when they actually get fulfilled? I think it would be. I mean, I would have liked to have been there on the day of uh, Pentecost and seen, you know, have some flames on my head and stuff. So um, now we're going to, I am going to build a sukkah, anybody that wants to come. It's called a sukkah. The word is, in Hebrew, the word is sukkot, which is basically means a tabernacle or a tent. Uh, and I guess this is our little summary here. So, here we go. <laughs> you guys don't know. Because <laughs> we, when we prepare to talk together, it's, it's way easier to just prepare your own talk and give it. Because then you don't have to coordinate with anybody. <laughs> but it's a real test of relationship to share the parts and figure out who's saying what. And not get mad at the other one who said your part and messed you up. And now you know what you're supposed to say. <laughs> One time, we, one, one year we did a marriage seminar for a bunch of people in the church we were in, and our daughter was about 12 years old, and one Sunday night in church, she said, when is this marriage seminar going to be over? I am so tired of hearing my mom and dad fight every week when they prepare. <laughs> so we didn't have too much fighting, actually, going into this one, just to let you know. So <laughs> what's the most fitting and appropriate cry for the Feast of Trumpets? Who was listening? Maranatha! The Lord has come. The Lord is coming. It's the best because we're, we're, we're actually declaring all the feasts of the Lord in that phrase. The Lord has come. The Lord is coming. Maranatha. And that's really what the feasts are about. And that's really what God was proclaiming for hundreds of years, yes, now thousands of years, the Lord, Messiah, has come. Messiah is coming. And for we people who are believers in the Lord, what should be the deepest thing in our heart and the thing that drives us and excites us and motivates us is the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. If you don't know that and you're not thinking about it, I want you to think about it today because he is coming. He came just exactly as it was rehearsed, and he will come. Just exactly as it is being rehearsed, he's coming back. And we want to be ready for him when he comes. We want to be found doing his will when he comes. And that's what we have right now, is time. <laughs> that's what we have in this season. Is this, this is a season of preparation before the Lord's return. And I want all of us and everybody we know and everybody we love and everybody we meet to get prepared for the return of the Lord. So when the trumpet blasts, it's kind of like saying to us, hey, you guys, wake up. He is coming, and you need to get ready. So what is the most appropriate cry or shout for the Feast of Trumpets? Maranatha. 
So now, James, I have another job, if you don't mind. In this box on the front row are trumpets for the young folks who don't have a trumpet. So if you didn't get to blow a trumpet, and I think there's enough of those in there also for the youth, so... Rob, will you come back? Get this one just sitting on the table. <laughs> so Pastor Brian is going to lead us in some worship, and he's also going to direct us when we need to uh, make our clamor. And then I think you're free to clamor on and off throughout the worship. Is that okay, Pastor Brian? Yeah, I hope you'll clamor. Okay. <laughs> 